This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com, and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com. It's my pleasure to have back with me this morning Charles Hugh Smith, well-known and prolific writer on the web, who is the publisher of the website of twominds.com. Good morning, Charles. Good morning, Gordon. Glad to be here. Well, Charles, I've got to compliment you on all the great work. Well, you always do great work, but this month on the nature of a work. Um, at least five in a row there that you put out. And, and just a great... They were a, kind of a follow-on for the from the... Uh, you took it to another level from when we did our video last month, so I compliment you. Thank you. So, so this month we're going to springboard from it, I guess, and we're going to talk about, in a, even though I don't think you were talking about it in your articles, but innovation. How do you learn to innovate? And, you know, we had um, two shows ago, and we kind of touched on it um, last month, this chart I have up now that showed this whole evolution that was really leading to innovation. And I don't think there's anything really new in that, and everybody's, I'm sure, tired of hearing that innovation counts. But what it all leads to is it says you now have the opportunity to be innovative like never before. Because the, the, the technology, the ability to collaborate, the things we talked about before are there, and we're seeing this as we also in all these new business models. So it's, it's an opportunity that uh, is presenting itself. Whether, and if you don't engage in this, you're going to get run over with it as, as, as time goes on. And this, this chart I have up here now, I thought was a good way of springboarding because, you know, I was in technology for most of my career and it was a highly innovative er period of, of, of time. And I certainly saw a lot of people who I would say were incredible innovators. And, and my conclusion was it's a balance between attitude, intelligence, curiosity, and sweat. And you've got to have all of those things before it really help, happens. But I would also say that this is somebody, I don't know whoever wrote it, but it's, it's not mine, but it's true, that innovation is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration because it's that sweat at the end of it that really makes a difference. And so it, it's not about being a genius. It's just about actually being driven with curiosity. You, you agree with that? Do you feel the same way? Or is that just me? No, absolutely. I think you've really nailed it, that those are critical elements of, of innovation, that if you're not curious about a variety of fields, then you're going to end up in a, um, a dead end of specialization. And when the market or innovation moves past your, your area of specialization, then, then um, you're toast. Yeah, we're going to talk a little later about, with I mentioned Steve Jobs who is probably the epitome to me, an innovator, who literally global industries simply because of his curiosity, his actual personal curiosity um, of what, what interested him. And it made, made all the difference. And that's the world that we live in. But the, the theme is, how do we learn to innovate, Charles? And I got up a slide here of some bullets that that you, you that are yours that you put down when your thoughts of how do you learn to innovate yeah I think that's an excellent question um, Gordon because that's really what our whole educational system should be focusing on and you know we tend to think um, geniuses are born but um, and and that's certainly true in, in many cases but um, probably five percent of the geniuses uh, innovators are born and 95 percent um, gather the skills of, of innovation and so um, how I contextualize this process of how do we learn to innovate is um, economist Michael Spence um, talks a lot about that profit and wages go to what's scarce mm -hmm. and what's abundant is, is, um, has no premium. You, you can't make money putting out what's already abundant. And so what Spence is pointing out is that in the world we have today, capital, abundant, cheap, got nothing there. Um, ability to pump out a million parts, 
abundant, cheap. There's a thousand factories in China that can make whatever you want in, in, in quantities of whatever you want. No problem. So what's scarce is um, the ability to solve problems that software can't. You know, what's scarce is the ability to write the program that solves problems, <laughs> if you will. And, and there's a lot of problems that, that are only humans can solve. The ones that collaboration with other humans, marketing. Computers are good at repeating you know, uh, processes. And so um, what we're really saying when we say learn to innovate is learn to solve problems. Well, how do you solve problems? You first, you have to have deep knowledge of specific fields. Um, a superficial knowledge isn't going to cut it. And then you need high level skills, meaning that you can actually implement the knowledge base you have. And then you have to be able to cross fertilize with other people in other fields that are related so that you're gathering um, potential solutions from a variety of fields, not just one specialty. And this requires professional level collaboration. And, um, and you go, what's professionalism? Well, you know, we take it for granted, but um, when you're in a classroom full of kids or, or even college students, you realize um, they, they're often lacking in, in the understanding that professionalism is being accountable, that, you know, for your own work. No excuses, no blaming other people. Good communication skills, you can communicate clearly across the, you know, the globe, if you will. You're, um, you're trustworthy. You do what you say you're going to do, um, and you're able to learn new skills. And um, I... I I thought there was a very interesting um, anecdote that came across the web that a college professor in Texas gave his entire uh, business class an F. He failed them all. Yeah. Never, Why? And he's been doing it for 20 years, but not failing, but teaching. First time he's ever done it. And why did he do that? Um, because of unprofessionalism, fundamentally. They, they were dissing him. Um, they, they were rude. Uh, they, didn't, they had zero accountability. And so um, he, you know, he basically fired them, as he should have, because those kids are going to discover in the world we're talking about, they're going to get an F from their collaborators too. So they're not going to have any work. <laughs> you know, so professionalism is is a key part of innovation because you can't just um, you have to learn to work with other people and um, share ideas and and leave your personal issues and everything at home. You know. And, and you have to be have cross cultural skills too. I think nowadays you have to be able to communicate clearly with people from a variety of cultures and settings because we have a global economy. And, and many, of the, many of the people you're collaborating with are not sitting in the desk beside you. They're sitting on right. I'm finding are sitting on the other side of the world, and you it's really irrelevant. You're sitting yeah. on Skype and whatever. You you got to remind yourself where they are. It's, it's what are they bringing to the table? How do they understand the problem? How creative are they in trying to figure out how to make things happen? And, and as you correctly say, and their professional way of just demeanor and how they handle themselves with the rest of the group. Right. Either, either they're a catalyst for making it happen or they become a barrier to making the innovational process happen. Personality and um, just teaming. Yes, and um, since we were talking about the classroom and that's where we're supposed to be teaching innovation, um, one of my buddies was uh, a, um, who's a technologist like you, a, a, an entrepreneur, he was invited to a business college, a business school, um, fairly high, highly ranked, um, to kind of collaborate with some students um, that were supposed to be dreaming up new ideas as, as their project, right? And, he, and what he reported was, uh, astonishingly to those of us who are um, <laughs> older is 95% of the projects had to do with streaming music or entertainment yes. and and, um, and so what we need to remind students of is just because they're obsessed and they spend a huge amount of time playing around with devices and, and, and consuming entertainment that the entertainment industry itself is is something like um, a tenth of one percent of the U.S. economy <laughs> And so, you know, the amount of the amount of fields that that are really desperate for innovation are um, vast, and entertainment is is like the smallest slice we could pick. You know, um, building comfort, um, reducing energy use. Um, these are these are fields that are a hundred times larger than entertainment. So, I, I guess the point here is, look at um, the whole spectrum of the economy. For fields that need innovation, and don't just focus on what um, 
on what uh, the media might be presenting as as the um, focus of of innovation. You're right because it's it's vast. Uh, how how I look at it, uh, Charles is, and you said you know innovation is about problem solving, and it and it, and it really is. But where you know where it starts is knowing what the problem is. What what is what is a what is the problem? How, what is going on that needs to be fixed? What's wrong with it? And be, before the innovative process of really solving it, which is a, a, a second part of the innovation, because the first part is knowing what, defining correctly the, the, the problem, is you have to have real knowledge of some area. Yes. And, and, and you're talking about music being a small, there are small part of the, of the world, the industry, there's so many industries out there that are going to go through massive changes that almost any industry or sector or place that you're in right now is going to go through and is going through change and you just need to know what the pro core problem is or problems and take one of those and work at it and, and bring a new sort of thinking to it and the whole idea of running a business is is uh, find a find a problem and fix it and uh, that's called find a market bring a solution to it and that's where the money will usually flow and that's where the work is going to come that's what we're going to call jobs are going to come from um, that whole creative and bringing key people around you that are going to help you solve that as all part of this innovative stream here. And we got you know a number of the charts we're going through. You we're, you know showing you on the right hand side the the processes because they're very structured. The of, of innovation is not just creative and a, a light bulb goes on. It's a as we said earlier per perspiration. It's a lot of a sweat. Try it. Stumble. Uh, you know, it's kind of like ready, aim, fire. You just got to go out, find out that you missed, and adjust your speed as opposed to adjust your aim. Whereas if you're just trying to line it up and get that shot away just perfect, somebody might have shot you before you got the shot away. <laughs> I think that's why they went with machine guns. But anyway, we're getting off track <laughs> for those of us who can't aim straight. But, Charles, I, you know, I, I, I said earlier this... Um, these four stages are four elements, attitude, intelligence, curiosity, and, and, and sweat. And, you know, like, like Steve Jobs, and, and I, I don't know if everybody has, has really studied his background, but, you know, as we said, he had a passion for something which he felt could be, and, and maybe as important, needed to be changed. And, and nobody agreed with him. Nobody thought there was money, et cetera. Matter of fact, it was so bad, really, that he got fired from Apple when he, the company he founded. So what did he do? He went over and he started, what was Pixar? Next, right? yeah. Next, 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 then, uh, first of all, he created uh, Nexus, I think it was called, uh, which was an operating system, um, which was a revolutionary operating system. Then he went to pick, start a Pixar to use it and animate. Re so two industries began to completely revolutionize. This was after he was fired, right? And then the, Apple was by then just, completely gone it was you know an old has been kind of place and they brought him back he asked him to come back in and what's the biggest most capitalized stock in the market today this revel because it's he had this passion this attitude of what needs to be changed and follow through but he and he and he he'll, he wasn't a genius but you know there aren't there aren't many many uh, innovators who are stupid either Okay, so there's a level of intelligence that you got to really bring to the table. But the, the over my experience in pe watching people who are is the, this incredible curiosity. They did they, no matter what somebody said, it, they 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 had to peel the onion and look underneath it and figure because they just inherently wanted to know more. And when they did that, they say, "Why is it that way? It doesn't need to be that way. We could do it differently this way." That's innovation. And but if you don't have it, and then of course they just once they, Steve Jobs was he I think he even was a self described to him to everybody an obsessive driven workaholic. Now, I'm not saying everybody should be a workaholic, but when you have a passion, your job doesn't end. It's 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 part of. It's like I used to say to people that work for me, it's like about retiring. You know, uh, everybody. Oh, I can't wait till I retire. Monet, famous painter, abstract or impressionist painter, painter, when he turned 65, do you think he threw down his paintbrushes and said, finally, retirement. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to paint anymore. No, he was actually blind and he was still trying to figure out how to paint <laughs> as the last stroke that it, before he died. That's what happens when you have a passion. And, and, and that's what work is going to be about for those who really engage in innovation. Comments on that, any of that? Uh, yeah. 
Well, uh, Gordon, you know, there's been several large uh, biographies written of, about Jobs recently, and um, what what pops out uh, to me in, in, in relating to what you just said about Jobs, this, the four uh, key points, is that um, Jobs took a tour of, the, of Xerox Park uh, before he founded Apple, and he noticed um, the, a mouse and a WYSIWYG um, uh, screen and and that was enough he he grabbed that idea and ran with it in a way that the guys at, at the Xerox Park did not they'd invented this um, these uh, key elements but they they didn't see the the market potential for it so this is a, a key element of, of innovation there's a lot of great ideas just laying around but they haven't been exploited or they haven't been assembled with other innovations that are related they really didn't know how to apply it where to use it Right. And it's that application of something that makes all the difference. And, you know, and, 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 St and Jobs' case, um, when he was in college, he, he was actually a terrible student. <laughs> he would, you know, he wasn't quite as bad as Bill Gates, who just quit Harvard and left to go out and start, or Michael Dell, who was building computers up in his dorm room before he quit. But so he did, he did, he did I think he did graduate. But anyway, but, but he was... He was all over different subjects, but he got enamored with calligraphy. He just he was just interested in how you know, different symbols were put together to communicate, and so he got into the the structure of, of of letters and formations. And that whole what we call font and font structure was one of the big things that made Apple go. Combined with the the mouse, the GUI, the interface, bringing it up on the screen. But but he, nobody else paid much attention to him. You just put a courier typewriter script up, and that was it. And I, he he said no, but, but but it was all, and it didn't come from somebody said, hey, you got to study calligraphy. Nobody said he just had this curiosity, and it all comes together. Right. So uh, you never know. It's like an education. That's why some of the times what bothers me where it's so core, you got to study this, 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 this. Sometimes you just have to follow your passion and your interest because the world is changing and they haven't decided what university college credits should be to, for the for the new world. I'm not trying to downplay education. I'm trying to say you need to be responsible when you're getting your education for what you're trying to get out of it. Excellent. It isn't up to the college or wherever. It's up to you. It's Excellent. your education. Yes, and um, the other point about Jobs that um, a lot of people know that he was quite a difficult person at times as an individual, you know, kind of a jerk, right? Very demanding. Oh, um, yeah, classic. <laughs> but what what people forget is that he, he um, engendered tremendous loyalty. In other words, he was not just a jerk. That was not, you couldn't reduce him down to that. He, he instilled... Um, tremendous pride in, 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 in people's work, um, and, and he, he had a devoted cadre of people that were inspired to create these uh, products with him. So, you know, you can't be a one-man show in today's world. You, you've got to be able to collaborate and, and bring the best out of your collaborators, you know. It's so, funny, it, 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 you're making a really good point, Charles. It's a funny balance because you've got to be a, a team player that motivates the people around you and with you to do even better things. So That's there's right. a leadership, but it comes from that passion they see in you and that interest, and, and it, it's contagious. So you have to have that skill, in my mind. But at the same time, you have to be a bit of a, you know, a real jerk. <laughs> because, because innovation is disruptive, okay? It's not status quo. And so, therefore, you have to be a little obnoxious to push things through, not with the people you're working with necessarily, but in the area that you're going to have to change and have to get it endorsed. So they just, they just don't know enough. They don't know the word no. They just keep pushing until they get the word yes. <laughs> and as I used to say, uh, you know, a no is the first step to getting to yes, and they just understood that in, inherently in, in, in pushing. Yeah, and we have a, a slide here, um, the barrier to innovation, and it's precisely what you're um, describing, which is the vested interests who are making money now from whatever it, the current system is, they're going to fight tooth and nail to resist any innovation that would disrupt their little um, cartel. It's generally a cartel or a monopoly or a cozy arrangement of uh, the state and, and the, and the uh, corporation. 
And so um, they're going to try to uh, snuff your innovation. <laughs> so exactly as you say, you have to be willing to fight. Because they see they've got all this built-in revenue profit margins. I saw it. I was at IBM. And uh, we, we were making great margins on the mainframe. Why did we want to bring out a PC that orders of magnitude cheaper and give up all that margins and have to sell carloads full of these PCs. So you're going to delay it as long as you human until the competition forces you to do it. Now in many cases corporations almost go out of business when that transition happens. That's and right. I actually was involved in one who did wait that long and actually did go out under from the whole process. So because it's so hard to give up. And these were not stupid people. Right. It's just that it's so difficult to give up we're, it's human nature. We don't want to give up security to go and take a risk. We want we want to protect it. But in this game, you can't. You've got to continuously kind of bet the farm. And you've, you've just got to go out and do it. And I know in my last days when I was in engineering, Charles, and I've mentioned this in previous shows, I can remember where 90% of next year's revenues was still on the design board. Do you know what kind of risk you're exposing yourself? Delays, somebody has a better product, etc. That's when you know you have a gun to your head. And that's the world, and that was quite a few years ago, that's the world we now live in. So, you, But you have to take those risks to stay alive. That's right. And, and Gordon, I think we have a couple of great slides here about the industries which have been successful at protecting themselves from innovation or, or channeling it to protect the vested interests. And for me, uh, two of our biggest expenses as a nation are health care, roughly 19% of GDP, and national defense, which is, I believe, around $800 billion a year. And so these are huge, almost trillion-dollar-a-year industries. And they, as, as we both know, there, there is selected elements of innovation in, in these industries, but they are ripe for massive disruption. And, and my example is healthcare. You know, you go in, you, you need a, a test done nowadays. You go, you sit in a waiting room. Um, you probably will get a disease that you didn't have before sitting next to a bunch of other ill people. You must be going to my waiting room. <laughs> I, I, I know the one you're talking about. Then, then you have to pay, unless you're, you have a gold-plated plan, you pay a bunch of money for this test. And then it's a, it's a ridiculous waste. And then you've got the overhead of this clinic, this hospital, all these people, you know, sitting behind desks and so on, shuffling all your paper or digital paper. What if we could do that at home? What if most of the tests you could strap something on your wrist, put it to your, um, your uh, smartphone, and, um, and that would automatically send um, the, the test results to your physician? Uh, look at how much uh, incredible waste would be thrown away by that. That's, that's what's, that's what's going to happen. We're not going to need so many clinics and so many people shuffling digital paper, you know. And then in national defense, the drone, um, the big, the big drones that can stay aloft for hours. Well, they've successfully refueled from a, an air tanker, right? That used to be a human-only skill. Okay, so now we don't need the pilots in the aircraft where they can be shot down and killed. They can be on the ground with a joystick. I mean, this is a huge, and we get rid of all the all the infrastructure in the aircraft to keep a human alive. You know, I mean, it, it's like, I think we're looking at 90% declines in the cost of aircraft. That a drone, you know, the F-35 is now $300 million each. Mm -hmm. And maybe a drone can be can do the exact same functions and, and protect the pilot's life and do it for $30 million. And so these are the kinds of, of innovations which are just sitting there waiting for someone to take advantage of them if we can overcome those people who are protecting their barriers. I, the soldier today, the basic so foot soldier today is really a communications node. He's carrying yeah. around video cameras and, and, and going where it, they call it C cubed I with command and control all the way back where people in the Pentagon are seeing what's going on right there. And we see it on TV all the time. That is reality. Right. Um, of the technology that changed it. And just not in the, you know, in, we're talking defense here. The, the, uh, the whole world of, of sur security surveillance is exploding. And the innovation that's going on there, cameras, facial IDs, um, the, uh, all elements of, of security. I think I counted 3,400 companies that are now involved in some element of security surveillance. I'm disappointed to tell you the vast majority are contracting to the American government, but <laughs> but nevertheless, right. they're, they're, uh, 
there's innovation going on there at monumental uh, rates, but they're changing these industries. We have two more industries too, right, Charles? Yeah, I mentioned um, higher education, of course. We know that... Uh, Boy, does that one need reinventing. Yeah, and we know that the best teachers are online for a few dollars. And so you don't, we don't need to spend $100,000 for largely mediocre teachers who are often underpaid, you know, postdoctoral. Um, it's just a broken model. And then the other model that we've talked about, uh, but we can always say more about it, is new models of work. And this is where the corporations, um, there are now corporations with no headquarters because it's unnecessary. There's no need for hundreds of people sitting in cubicles shuffling, you know, um, digital files. The work is done by teams that are assembled um, as needed um, on a global basis. And you were just telling me an anecdote about um, about your own business that um, one of your collaborators is like in Europe and um, and he was surprised at how your business has has um, changed in in the process of of becoming globalized. Right. Eight months ago, we had a business model, and eight months and I told him it was going to change, but I didn't know how. And eight months later, it's a completely different business model. And it wasn't that we were so wrong initially. It's just that we didn't know what we didn't know. And as we learned, <laughs> yeah. we suddenly realized there's a better way of doing this, most building this most trap. And, and, and nobody else is doing it because nobody started on that journey. And, but you've got you've to you've get out there and you, you've got to start on it to be able to, to um, as I said earlier, it's, you know, it's uh, ready, fire, aim. You've just got to go at it and keep correcting as, as, you, as you go along. But, you know, innovation, Charles, is so much around us every day. The things that are changing and the industries that are coming out and it's so rapid with technology that we don't, I don't even think we really pay attention to it. We just accept it to the, to the degree where we need to understand if we're not participating in it, we're going to get run over by it. And by that, I mean, if you don't have a job where you're truly innovating and feel you're innovating in some fashion, not just technology, you know, you make a good point. It's, it's process, it's management structure. There's so many things in, that, that require the innovation. If you're not innovation, if you're not doing it, you're going to get run over. You're going to be what they, I think they refer to as roadkill. Right, and um, you have a nice uh, graphic here that you um, posted uh, about the process, the the offerings, the delivery, finance, I, I, and I because I I, um, I come from the building trades as well as getting a degree in philosophy. <laughs> um, I know that you know cordless tools and um, what I call YouTube University. There are so many YouTube uh, videos now showing you how to repair. Um, appliances that if you're in the trades, you need to keep learning. In other words, if you know how to fix washing machines and dryers, well, you need to study YouTube University and learn how to repair, you know, refrigerators as well. And um, so, even in something that's very traditional like the building trades, there is a lot of innovation going on in new materials, new tools, and new processes to do things faster, better, cheaper. You know, Charles, we're I we're doing a video here. We're on a split screen between the two of us. Twelve months ago, nobody was doing this, right? And now, and look where we're at right now. And what a lot of our listeners need to understand is the business models behind this screen would really surprise you of, of how the money is actually made. And I challenge you: how do we, how do we, how do Charles and I make money from this, from doing this video? And that's there's so many curious things you need to be curious about and go out and explore. I'll answer the question. We're not making any money on this one, Charles, but but there is money in, in doing this sort of thing with the, with the technology. Charles, we're up against a hard line. I mean, there's so much to, to uh, talk about here. Any key message you want to leave with our listeners here? I think the, um, the fact that innovation can be learned and that, and, and that learning is part of that process of, of innovation is actually constantly learning. I think it's natural for people to want to be curious and innovate. And uh, what you've got to make sure today is that you don't find yourself in an occupation that doesn't allow you to do that. Because if you don't, it's only a matter of time before you're going to be looking for work. Excellent. And, and so you need to, you really need to look at what you're doing. Just don't take a job because it's for the sake of a, a job, it's going to be temporary. Um, 
you know, and before we talk, started the show, I was thinking that at the turn of the century, last century, we had a, a very small number of, of really creative guys that, that were out there. Henry Ford and um, um, the person that did the light bulb. Uh, Edison. Edison, etc. But a small percentage of them. And then by the 1920s, it was much higher. Factories were exploding. We were coming up with all sorts of ideas. I would say, you know, maybe 8, 10, 12 percent of the population was really being very, very innovative. The rest just did my farm work, did my work in my factory, etc. And it's exploded since then. It's gone exponential. exponential. I would suggest that maybe today most jobs, 40 percent, require a high degree or a high level of innovation and creativity in the work that you're doing and participating. And that's only 40%. I think in the next eight to 10 years, it's gonna be 70 or 80% if you're not in this whole really creative process somehow. Um, I think it's only, I think we're still early, is what I'm saying, we're still early. The technology is just arriving now to allow us to take it to this level. So either engage on it or um, become roadkill, it's your choice. <laughs> We have to wrap. Charles, I got up a slide here that shows you the list of some of the articles, that, and you've done others that are up. Um, I've written some on, on, um, on innovation also, um, so they're, they're available if anybody wants to do anything more. Charles, can you tell our listeners how they could uh, learn more about your work besides these articles? Um, visit me at of2minds.com and uh, take a look at um, the free parts of my latest book, Get a Job, Build a Real Career in a Bewildering Economy. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, thanks. I, I'm looking forward to next month. We're going to continue with this series and this, uh, and this thinking, but we've got, uh, we've got a lot more things to talk about. Talk to you next month. Okay. Thank you very much, Gordon. Bye. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at gordontlong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at gordontlong.com.